Hello everyone, my name is Mark Smith and I'm the online Sunday school teacher at Red House Baptist Church. Welcome, I'm glad you've joined me today as we're beginning our study of the book of Job and then we'll go into the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, like I'd said before, I'm kind of looking forward to, to this long-term study, but you know, as we've gotten into this, uh, man, I'm finding it tough. It's, it's a tough study for me, but uh, I am enjoying it. And let me just go ahead and say, I don't I don't come up with these things on my own. We use Explore the Bible. It's put out by Lifeway. And uh, I'm so thankful that I have this material. And I think they do a wonderful job. They're not perfect, uh, just like I'm not perfect and just like you're not perfect. But uh, they, they sure are a great resource and a great tool as uh, we put these lessons together and we share them together and we walk through them together. And I hope you do that. I, I hope you'll feel free to just pause this, look back maybe at some scripture that um, is maybe something that you've thought about and you want to find that and use this as a time to, to actually go into a study. And um, I, I feel like you're always going to get something out of that when you do that, when you, when you actually study the Word of God. And uh, that's one of the reasons I enjoy teaching this is because it, it forces me into a study because I don't know. Uh, there's so many things I don't know that I'm forced to study this and to look up other scriptures. And, uh, and, and it's so good for me to be able to do that. And it is for you. It is for each and every one of us. So uh, let me go ahead and clean some of this up. I don't know what's going on here, but um, I do need to clean some of it up. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. That's much better. So. Um, as usual, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. That way, you know, if we bathe this in prayer, then God will lead us and guide us, and uh, we certainly want to do that. So bow with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the sunshine, for the warmth, and for the beauty of your creation. And God, I just, I praise you for all that you do. And Father, even in the times of strife, even in the times of suffering that we go through. God, I'm just so grateful to you that I know that you're there, even in times of maybe when I feel lonely or, uh, and, and there might even be times when we feel abandoned. We know deep down that you are always there and that your Holy Spirit dwells in us. And God, I'm just so thankful to you for that. Uh, God, go with us today as we study your word, lead us and guide us, uh, that we might be better doers of the word and that we might be example to those around us. Father, we just thank you for all that you do, and we praise your holy name and that of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, so the title of today's lesson is Redemption Found. Believers can trust God to be faithful to them. And, you know, this, this comes from Job, and as we've been talking about Job, he's in, he's in this uh, a moment of despair that he's going through all these horrible things in his life, but even in the midst of it, one of the things that he recognizes is that there is redemption to be found, and certainly we can. You see, he's having to trust that God is going to send a redeemer. We already know that he has sent a redeemer in his son, Jesus. So uh, we have it better than Job did, and believers can trust God to be faithful to them, and it comes from Job 19, verses 19 through 29. And you might recognize a face or two on that, but just as an introduction, not long ago, new television shows became all the rage. It was all about reality TV. And I was wondering if any of you all have a favorite reality show. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're like, I hate reality shows. Um, but for many people, they kind of latched on to one or two reality shows that they absolutely love. And then I, if, if you're one of those people, why do you think they're so interesting? Even if you're not, why do you think people are drawn to those? Now, Pam and I will watch The Voice or America's Got Talent. You know, those are two of the reality shows that we watch, and, and they're competitions. And, you know, I've shared with many of you before, if you've watched any of these, I'm a very competitive person. I love to compete. But I enjoy being a judge in terms of watching these shows and saying, you know what, she has an incredible voice. Wow, that was, that was just beautiful from beginning to end or... Yikes, she tried to hit that high note. It wasn't too good. Uh, but, you know, I also like to guess who will be advanced in these competitions and who won't. So Pam may look at one of these and go, you know what? Oh, my goodness, that dance group, they were fantastic. I know they're going through. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if they are or not. I really think it's probably going to be this, that, or the other. Uh, 
And, and then who, who's going to have to go home? So those are some of the things that we do. Uh, and, and I think that people just like to at least feel like they're, they're part of this reality that's going on. Earlier this week, a friend of mine uh, shared um, that he watches a show about survival in Alaska. They take, I don't know, 10, 12 people and they're allowed to choose 10 different items and then they drop them off individually in remote parts of Alaska and they have to live on their own. They teach them how to film themselves and then they pick those up. They give them a satellite phone and, and when you're ready to say, you know, I'm done, uh, when you're ready to tap out, you call them and you say, all right, I'm done with this. So he was telling me a little bit about this show and whoever, whoever survives out there the longest wins. And he says, you know, people will, they'll carve out canoes to go out and fishing. They'll make their own uh, fish hooks that they'll build cabins with their bare hands. And it, you know, all of that's kind of cool. But he asked me, he said, what do you think is the biggest reason that people give up? What do you think is the number one reason? And I said that I thought it was the isolation or the loneliness. Um, and I think I shocked him because I actually got something right because the name of the show was Alone. I think that's what he said the name of the show was. And loneliness was the main reason that people dropped out. They wanted to, they wanted to see their families and they wanted to see their friends and they missed them terribly. And he said, you know, they would film beforehand and they'd say, you know, I'm going to win this thing and you won't see me for six months. And then two weeks later, they're back home because they missed their families and their friends so much. And they were just isolated. And one of the things I thought about, uh, and it just occurred to me that if I'm going to be somewhere isolated for a period of time, I want the Bible because I think, you know, I, I thought I would need something to read. And then what would be the best thing in the world to read? Well, it's the Bible. I can read a novel and I'm probably not going to read it a second, third or fourth time. But the Bible, man, you know, God speaks to you through the Bible. And I just think that would be it, it would counteract some of the loneliness. And that's that's what I came up with. So how does loneliness impact you? And, and you've probably all felt lonely at some time or another. And it can be debilitating, as it is in this, this uh, uh, reality TV show that Van was talking about. Um, feeling alone doesn't even have to take place in Alaska when you're all by yourself. You can feel lonely and be surrounded by 100 people. Okay, I, I know there were kids who went to school that I, that, where I was teaching that felt lonely, even though... There were 2,000 teenagers there. And as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit in us and the knowledge that we're in God's hands at all times. We can sometimes forget that. We can let the experiences that we have make us feel alone. And just like Job, and that's how Job was feeling, even as he was surrounded by his friends. So I, I, I don't know. I do that sometimes. So, uh, so let's talk about that real quick. We're going to focus on Job 19 verses 19 through 22. And I'll go ahead and just read that very quickly. And it says, all of my best friends despise me and those I love have turned against me. My skin and my flesh cling to my bones. I have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. We still use that phrase. Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy for God's hand has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? Man, he is desperate at this point. He is hurting at this point. And his friends, they don't seem to be helping him. All right, so let's just kind of go ahead and review a little bit of what's going on. So three of Job's friends came by his side when they found out that his wealth was gone, his family had been taken from him, his children were all dead, uh, he, he's lost his, his property, and then his health is gone, that, that a Satan has attacked his health, and he's covered with boils and, and you know, from head to toe. He's in, he's in horrible shape. But rather than comforting him, they're trying to find out what the reason is for his suffering. This is uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. So they're just trying to figure it out, and their wisdom tells them, their experiences tell them that Job is suffering because he's a sinner. And he's earned his punishment. He's done something to bring the hand of God against him. So what he needs to do is he needs to figure out what that is. And once you figure out what that is, repent of that sin. 
That's what they want him to do because that's that's what their collective wisdom has told them. So as we read through the book of Job, what we see is Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Zophar, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, they go through this thing where they're telling him, man, you've done something and you need to figure out what it is. Quit resisting it. Quit pretending that, that you haven't done something because you know you have. Otherwise, God wouldn't be doing this. And then you hear Job's response. And then the next one jumps in and says, I agree with him. You've done something. And they just keep pounding him time and time again with this. And they're accusing him, basically saying you've earned your punishment. So when we read through um, these verses, verses 19 through 22, how did Job assess the help that was being provided by his friends in verse 19 in particular? Well, he believed that they had turned on him. That's what he says. He says, all of my best friends despise me. Those I love have turned against me. That's, that's what he says. You turned against me. I needed you as my friends to come in and help, but you've turned against me. So why did he believe they had turned on him? And, you know, I'll be honest with you guys. I read through this and I think sometimes I can be like one of these friends of Job. I can say somebody tells me, they say, look, I've got this problem. I'm suffering. You know, this is going on. I want to fix it. So I'm going to tell you what I think. You know, you, you probably need to do this, probably need to do that, probably shouldn't have done this, never do that again. And that's kind of what his friends are doing right here. And he believes they've turned on him, primarily because they're not giving him any comfort. They're charging him with sins against God. They're trusting in their own wisdom. They're trusting in their own experiences. And they're trying to diagnose his problem. And that's not what Job wants. You see, part of their reasoning was that Job is accusing God of striking him with no reason. And they're saying, that's nonsense. That's not the way God operates in our wisdom and in our understanding. And again, that's so important because we have to realize that our ways are not God's ways. His ways are higher than ours. They didn't understand that. What Job needed from his friends at this time was somebody to sit maybe and just listen to him. I, and guys, I'm horrible. I'm learning, but I'm horrible. And I think a lot of us, maybe husbands, tend to be that way. Our wives want to talk to us about maybe something that's going on in their lives and something that they just want to express to us. And what they really want from us is to shut up and comfort them. Tell them that we're sorry. Ask them if there's anything we can do. Not fix the problem. Job's friends are trying to fix his problem, and they think the problem is Job. You're the problem, Job. And to his friends, this is nonsense. Obviously, he has sinned against God. And that's what, that's what they've come to at that point. So how does Job assess his own health at this point? And you look at verse 20, my skin and my flesh cling to my bones. I've escaped with only the skin of my teeth. He's barely hanging on here. That's what he says. I am barely even hanging on. I've lost all this other stuff. Now I'm teetering between life and death. And it, in earlier verses, he was saying, I think back in, in chapter 14, I'd rather be dead. You know, relieve me of this suffering. All right, so that's where he is at this point. So what is it that Job really wants from his friends here? What, what is he asking for? What, what is he seeking from them? And it's mercy. That's so what he says. He says, hey, don't, don't accuse me. God's already punishing me for something I haven't done. Don't pile on. He wants their compassion, not their accusations. And, and I know people who have been told by well-meaning Christians that they're suffering due to their own sin in their lives. You know, this, you're suffering because of the sin in your life. We, we don't need to do that, all right? Sometimes that's true, but it's not helpful in their time of need while they're suffering. You see, Job wants comfort. And really, as Christians, we have an obligation to comfort people in their time of suffering. Not, not point fingers and accuse, but to help them. So 
How do we answer people who are suffering and want to know where God is and why he's not doing something to stop it? Question mark. I don't have a question mark. Question mark. And often we just don't know. At least I don't. Okay? We do know that God is compassionate and loving. We know that he gave his son to die for us. If, if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you know that in your heart of hearts. You also know that in a sinful world, the world in which we live, sometimes we're just victims of living in a sinful world. And there's sinfulness all around us. And there are consequences to sin. And I kind of thought of this, if we're in a furnace, we may ask, why is it so hot in here? Well, the answer is because you're in a furnace. That's why it's hot. Okay. We, and the same answer, why is, why is uh, uh, life so hard? Well, we're in a sinful world. We're in that furnace. And the best thing that we can do for those who are walking through that is to sympathize and to love those who are suffering. And, you know, I, I, uh, Google image, that's where I go to get some of these pictures and so forth, but uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and, and I thought of them in the furnace. And even while they were in the furnace, they weren't alone, but they had, they had Jesus with them. Old Testament, they had Jesus with them in the furnace. Um, so, you know, if you're suffering right now, know that you're not alone. All right, and, and then we'll get into that here in just a little bit. But, but the friends weren't being helpful. In fact, they were being the opposite of helpful. Um, so let's look at the next set of verses, verses 23 through 27. And this is Job speaking. I wish that my words were written down, that they were recorded on a scroll or were inscribed in stone forever by an iron stylus and lead. So what he said, I wish somebody would write down what I'm getting ready to say. Then he says, but I know that my redeemer lives and at the end he will stand on the dust. Even after my skin has been destroyed, yet I will see God in my flesh. I will see him myself. My eyes will look at him, not as a stranger. My heart longs within me. Guys, that is in the deepest despair. That glimmer comes out that he has a living Redeemer. He knows that. So what seems odd, though, about these verses in the midst of his suffering and his confusion as to his condition? Why am I suffering? It's the opposite of what he's been expressing. He's been expressing despair. He's been expressing almost an anger with God as to why am I, why are you doing this? Tell me what's going on. Reveal to me what's going on so that I can put an end to this or so that you'll put an end to it. And, and he's feeling helpless and almost hopeless. But even in the midst of this, we see such strong words of affirmation that God will redeem him. He knows that about his God. Even as Satan is attacking him, he knows it. So why would Job want these next few declarations to be written down? Why does he say, I wish these words would just be written down? All right because he knows that it's something that's too important to be forgotten. In the midst of his suffering, he wants people that come after him to know that in the midst of your suffering, there is a living redeemer. God has a plan. Now, most Bible scholars believe, based upon what I've read, that Job is referring to the Messiah as his redeemer. Guys, this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Jesus lived at that time, and he lives now, all right? He lived before his birth, he lived before his death, and he lives after his death. He continues to live today. And what a, and what a powerful message from Job in the midst of his suffering. And I know people who have gone through horrendous things in this life, and their testimonies are so powerful as they talk about how God, even in the midst of their suffering and not understanding why, they found that God was constantly with them. And man, what, what, a, what a great testimony that is. So what is Job's hope here? What is his hope throughout all of this? 
that at some point his suffering is going to end and he's going to get to see God in the flesh, in his, in his face. It's the greatest desire of his heart. That's what he says. It's in the greatest desire of his heart. He wants to be in the presence of God. And at that point, he will understand why this has happened. All right. And he'll actually be vindicated. That's one of the things that it says here by, by uh, the gentleman who put this study together said he wants to stand before God and be vindicated. Ask God, God, why did this happen? And God's going to tell us because of Satan. And he's going to say, yes, I'm vindicated. I didn't bring this on myself. And I think that leads to the question. How can we be vindicated before God? Because as we read through this, God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job. You see, I know that I'm not blameless. You aren't either, I'm guessing, all right? I don't want to stand before God and give an account of the sins in my life. I do not want to defend the sins in my heart either. I know I can't stand before God and say, God, I'm blameless. I gave you everything, and, and I was completely obedient to you. I know I can't say that. So how can we be vindicated before God? Because God provided a redeemer in his son, Jesus. And through Jesus, our sins can be washed away by the blood of his sacrifice. Now, look, this may sound strange to you. You may say, you Christians talking about being washed in blood? That's sick. That's gross. It's not. It's beautiful. Because one of the things God required for the atonement of sin was a blood sacrifice. Sin causes death. So you have to sacrifice something to get atoned for that sin. But that atonement lasts until you've sinned again and then it's done. You see, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. His life was perfect. His perfection covers up all of our sins if we accept that gift. We can stand sinless before the Father, that should have been capitalized, with a great counselor at our side. So I, I'm going to stand before God as a sinner. But Jesus is going to stand next to me as my counselor and say, anything you have against him, it's done. He's mine. I died for him. All you got to do is accept that gift. There's no other way to be vindicated before God. God sacrificed the perfect lamb to intercede on our behalf if we accept that gift and make him Lord of our lives. He is the only way. There is no other way. If there's another way, why would God allow what we see in that picture to happen? And I'm telling you, he wouldn't. Right? Jesus is the only way. And what a beautiful, beautiful picture that is. And what an awesome sacrifice that is for us. All right, so let's, let's look at the last set of verses. And by the way, Job knew, even in the midst of his turmoil, that the Redeemer was already, he's already there. Didn't understand it yet, but he knew that the Messiah would come. So verses 28 and 29, and this again, Job talking now to his friends. If you say, how will we pursue him since the root of the problem lies with him? Then be afraid of the sword because wrath brings punishment by the sword so that you may know there is a judgment. And I've read through that, and I've read through that, and I've read through that, and I wasn't quite sure I understood it, uh, which is true of most things that I read. Then I read the explanation that the author of this had, had said, and, and it kind of put things into perspective. What is Job's warning to his friends here? It made perfect sense once I read through that explanation. And essentially, Job told them that they might be judged by the same standards that they're using against him. And he's telling them, he's warning them. That's what it says, warning issue. Guys, be careful how you're judging me, okay? Because their understanding was that God blesses those who love him and are obedient to him, 
but he punishes the sinful and the disobedient. So obviously, Job is being punished here, therefore he must be sinful and disobedient. What do we know about every single person except for Jesus who walked the earth? It's about Moses, Noah, David, uh, Abraham. I mean, we go on and on. They're all sinners, every one of them. Every single one of them. What he's saying is, be careful because if you're judging me by that standard, be aware that God may judge you by the same standard. Now, did Job tell his friends this out of spite? Is he saying, you know, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword? And is, is that what he's saying? No. He's saying, and, and I didn't mean that was an uh, accusation. Jesus had said that. But, but he's showing them compassion by warning them of a biblical truth. Guys, when you share the gospel truth with someone, they may be offended by that. But you don't do that because you hate them or you spite them. You do that because you love them. Job is sharing a truth. And it's biblical truth. It's backed up by scripture. God hates a lying witness. It says that, Proverbs 6, 19, six things God hates. Okay? But also, in Proverbs 12, 18, he says, There is one who speaks rashly like a piercing sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. He's telling them, yes, show compassion, show love, show understanding. I don't need you to pile on. And guys, as Christians, I think that's a powerful lesson. When those we love are going through a tough time, we can show compassion and use words of healing, not, not pile on and be accusational. As we're told to do this by the Word of God, this isn't Mark saying this. This is the Word of God saying this. And you don't trust me. I'm fallible. But you can always trust the Word of God because it is infallible, just like our God. All right, guys, thank you for joining me. Thank you for, for your study. And do, do study this and read through the book of Job, and then we'll go through the book of Ecclesiastes as well. I hope you have a great week. I'm going to be gone next week. I'm going to be at church on Sunday. So if you're thinking about coming to Sunday school, I'll be there uh, uh, with Grace and Truth. We'll be in the gymnasium. And then at uh, 1045, our worship service will be in the sanctuary. And uh, man, we'd absolutely love to have you. So uh, come join us. If, if you've not been there in a while or you've never been, our doors are open and we would absolutely love to have you come worship with us. Guys, thanks for joining me. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Love you guys.